perspective uh, organized by Cisco, the Italian Society for the Study of Contemporary History, uh, a webinar series on the way towards the conference, which will be held uh, next June. Uh, welcome to our distinguished guests, Eric Jan Zürker, the known Turkologist, the Professor Emeritus of Turkish Studies at Leiden University, and to Andrea Graziosi, uh, uh, a former president of Cisco and Professor of Contemporary History at Federico II University. I'm uh, Leano Cera, a Turkologist working at Florentale University and chairing this event as an ordinary member of the society. And uh, I will now, uh, I will be also the moderator in the Q&A session. So uh, before introducing topic of the webinar, just uh, again, I will kindly ask you to mute or keep muted your mic all the time. And at the end of the lecture, there will be time. So for the question, we can, you can participate uh raising your virtually your hand or uh, writing directly in the chat i will add some few words about our guest uh eric Zürker. for me it's a big honor and a privilege uh, to introduce him here because as a scholar of Tur in turkish studies and historian of modern turkey i'm part of the large global mass of scholars who learn a lot thanks to Zürker's books and articles and still take inspiration from his academic work and research. Um, Eric Zürker is professor, uh, was professor, is professor emeritus at Leiden University. And just uh, less than one year ago, he was academic director on the Leiden Institute of Various Studies. He was also director of the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam, where uh, besides there are also very relevant archival uh, collections for the history of modern Turkey. It's our job to resume here his work. He taught in many, very many universities around the world, has written extensively on Turkey, and also uh, regularly comments on current affairs of uh, Turkey uh, to international media. And um, just, just let me say that his book, Turkey and Modern History, is considered a classic textbook in uh, many universities and uh, in Italian for, so for our public Italian audience, uh, uh, I want to say that uh, the book is entitled Porta d'Oriente, Storia della Turchia, is edited by Donzelis, the last revised uh, edition. Uh, I'll, um, I, then, I, I, I will introduce later our, uh, our other guests, so our discussant Andrea Gaziosi. Gaziosi. But let me uh, just uh, say about uh, Eric Jan Zürker that his work is, uh, was mainly concentrated about the, the, this transitional period between Ottoman Empire and the Republic of Turkey and on the role of a young Turk generation. But it's very interesting that he opened up uh, the study of Turkey to the social dimension, so social history, not only political history. And, um, uh, it's uh, it's this working on this transitional period make uh, made so very uh, a very important a very important uh, focus also on the political tools as we maybe we will see today uh, political tools used uh, before uh, the, before the Kemalist and then uh, after. That. Um, about our talk today, the talk is entitled Islamists and Kemalists in Turkey, Democratic Competition Between Two Forces with Deeply Authoritarian Roots. Uh, so as the title uh, suggests, uh, there is a, a big complexity when we talk about Turkey. So where, uh, so we have uh, Islamists, Kemalists as protagonists, uh, a democratic competition who works with uh, authoritarian tools, roots. Uh, after having analyzed so democracy in Latin America, US, and India in this webinar, now we move uh, to Turkey. So it's closer to us, uh, the other side of the Mediterranean. Uh, here, the term of democracy is, uh, so since decades, one of the most used, abused, and misused 
also in the in the political discourse in the public discourse and in the name of democracy or even of the democratization process turkey has experienced coup d'etat uh, relevant transition pro processes and at the same time democracy has appeared for a very long period as a possible horizon of hope and reality for the effective implementation of human and civil rights so let's think for example what has meant the democratization promise connected for many years to the EU integration process in the eyes of many oppositional groups, especially for Kurdish people. So how democracy is a fluid concept in Turkey has been maybe clear to our Italian audience in the very last diplomatic incident occurred when our PM Draghi called Erdogan a dictator and as a reaction, the president of the Republic of Turkey defined his statement crude and indecent but of course, inappropriate as he came to power by election. So democracy and election are strictly connected always in Turkey, even if the fair elections are uh, very often profoundly discussed. Now, uh, so um, uh, I, won't, I don't want to take the floor so longer. Uh, just uh, I, maybe I will see some few words later on if there will be time. Uh, just to just to say that uh, uh, in Turkey now the 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 coup the day of the attempted coup on the, the July the fifteenth is called the coup the, the the day of democracy so the day for democracy and martyrs and it's uh, uh, of course it's not the first national day in this case called the day of democracy connected and commemorating a coup attempt. Uh, let's be, let's uh, let me give the floor to uh, Professor Zürkers, and uh, and I will mute myself my, my mic. Thank you very much, there for this nice introduction, and that's it's a real pleasure to be you know uh, among you, even though uh, only virtually and digitally, uh, and because it means being among friends, among many. Uh, very familiar and very friendly faces. Uh, that that uh, is a wonderful feeling. Uh, even if um, I'm holed up in my study in a, a village in the Netherlands, it still feels connected. Um, yes, um, today's topic is about uh, Turkish democracy, uh, democracy in Turkey, and obviously since all of you are interested in contemporary history and in politics, political systems, um, you will be aware that there's a problem there, that democracy in Turkey is highly problematic. And there are many ways of approaching that subject, uh, but for me as a, as a historian, I think uh, a productive way might be to to define the problem in the following way. Uh, the, when you look at the um, development of democracy in Europe, uh, you could say that uh, there are two movements that have been uh, quintessential to that development, uh, liberalism in the 19th century and social democracy in the 20th. Um, not exclusively, of course, but those have been very important driving forces. And unfortunately, um, both of them have always been extremely weak in Turkey. Both uh, socialism and social democracy and uh, certainly liberalism um, hardly have a history in Turkey. There's, there's very little uh, in at least um, um, not in the sense that they've been able to influence the development of the political system to any meaningful extent. So <clears throat> yet um, Turkey has a, uh, at least superficially democratic system, a system based on a constitution, a parliament, elections, and an elected government. Uh, it is a republic, but uh, because I would say of the lack of development of uh, liberalism and socialism in Turkey's history, 
that democracy has become the arena, so to speak, for a struggle between two forces, which each of them is devoid of real democratic roots. Both of them have uh, very strong authoritarian roots, but very different ones. And one of those movements is what is very often called uh, Kemalists, um, broadly speaking, the followers of the founder of the Turkish Republic, Kemal Atatürk, um, and the other one is what is very broadly call, uh, called Islamists, uh, people who think that um, Turkey as a society, but also Turkey as a political system, has to be based on religious Islamic and more precisely Sunni Islamic values. So these are the two forces that are... Um, struggling for power in, in Turkey and have been for a very long time. And uh, the oldest of the two, you might say, is that of the Kemalists, at least uh, when we look a bit further back and look at the movement called the Young Turks. And the Young Turks is a movement that um, has its origins in the 1890s. And it was modeled after the many young movements in, in Europe, uh, young Germany, young Italy. And it's no coincidence that it starts at the centenary of the French Revolution. It is a movement that is started by um, intellectuals who are mostly civil servants, but is gradually taken over by military officers, by the first decade of the 20th century, it is dominated by young military officers. And this Young Turk movement is inspired by European currents of thought. And they aim to revive the Ottoman Empire. And they aim to do so by uh, taking inspiration from positivism, uh, materialism, and secularism. They are not intellectuals or thinkers. So in their, let's say, in their program, uh, the, it's, it's not the finesse of positivism or materialism or secularism that is important. It's just the soup, the mixture of the three. Um, but it's what they embrace is a worldview based on elements of those three. And what that means is that they see themselves, they see themselves as the voice of the nation. They think that for the Ottoman Empire to become modern and strong, it needs to be based on uh, the consent of the people. And in that sense that they, uh, the Ottoman Empire has to become a constitutional democratic state with an elected parliament, but uh, they also see themselves as the educators of the people. And they also see themselves as the teachers of the people. And um, that double attitude towards the nation as they see it uh, has profound consequences. It means that when they come to power, which is in 1908, um, and subsequently when members of their movement found the Republic of Turkey in 1923, um, they strongly based themselves on the idea that sovereignty belongs to the nation. Uh, in fact, uh, in their first attempt at a uh, kind of a constitution um, in 1921, uh, uh, they say so. Sovereignty belongs unconditionally to the nation. Uh, but at the same time, because they see themselves as enlightened educators of the nation, of a backward nation, they also think that that nation 
should be guided and cannot be trusted to take the right decisions. And they, in that sense, take a very um, developmentalist uh, view, which at times, when you look at the discourse, reminds you actually of colonial administrators in which they see themselves as a vanguard, um, a leadership that needs to educate a, um, a backward people. For them, democracy belongs to what they see as modernity. And their idea of modern modernity incorporates the idea of representative elected government. Um, so, both in the final years of the Ottoman Empire, when the young Turk Turks are in power, and in the first 25 years of the Republic, when they are still in power, but then are called Kemalists, um, you find that there are elections every four years, and that there is an elected government, that there is a parliament called the National Assembly in the Republic. Uh, but it is important to, to understand that for these young Turks and later Kemalists, democracy was more of a means than an end. It was a means to strengthen and to modernize the country. And what that meant is that until 1946, basically uh, these, are, these elections are rituals. The, rit the elections that, every, that take place every four years are rituals. Most of the time, there's only one party that puts forward uh, candidates and the party of the Kemalists, of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk himself, and um, sometimes there is a choice between candidates in, in some dis, uh, districts, uh, but there's no real political competition. It's not a competitive environment. Paradoxically, because this um, democratic system of the early Republic is so stage managed, it allows for a formal structure that puts all power into the National Assembly. And when you look at the Turkish constitution of the early Republic uh, or at the, uh, uh, the statutes of the, of the parliament, you see that um, parliament is all powerful. Uh, cabinet is elected uh, from parliament. The president is elected uh, by and from parliament. Um, it doesn't really matter uh, because it's a single party state in which a um, young Turk elite, um, largely with a military background, actually determines policies and the function of uh, parliament or the National Assembly is to support it. Um, that becomes a, a big problem after the introduction of multi-party politics in Turkey after World War II. Because now, uh, partly uh, for internal reasons, pressure uh, in the country, and also partly uh, because the Turkish government wants the country to be incorporated into the West in the Cold War environment. Um, Multi-party politics are introduced. And after very dubious elections in 1946, in 1950, four years later, there are actually free and fair elections in Turkey for the very first time. And the opposition comes to power and stays in power for 10 years. But now there's a real problem because, because all power has been concentrated in this National Assembly. The fact that one party has a majority 
however slight, in that assembly makes that party all powerful. So Turkey becomes a textbook case of majoritarianism. The uh, single party constitution leads to a very strange result in a multi-party environment. Uh, what it means is that the, um, the party that is not in power, the former Kemalists, uh, actually are completely sidelined during those 10 years, 1950 to 1960, that the opposition is in power. However, slight a majority in parliament or among the electorate at large, um, they, they have no reason to take the ideas or the interests of the um, minority into account at all. That leads to a very uh, tense situation uh, where a large minority of the country feels that it's not heard at all, that it is deprived of its rights. And that is one of the reasons that leads to a military takeover, the first military takeover in 1960. Now, another paradox there, uh, for as long as the country had been in the hands of former generals, former military officers like Atatürk and his successor Inönü and the majority of the people who surrounded him, in other words, between 1923 and 1950, the army had stayed out of politics. The army stayed out of politics because former top military men were in charge. After 1950, that's no longer the case when the opposition comes to power. And that leads to um, a military coup in 1960. Now, the military who take over power, try to remedy what they see as the big problem in, in the system. And that is this all powerful national assembly. So they introduce a system in which power is much more widely spread among institutions. And also where um, the electoral system is changed in such a way that it will become very difficult for parties to gain an absolute majority. In other words, uh, they force the political system into coalition politics. Um, that is one remedy that the army seeks, but there's another one. And the other one is that under the 1961 constitution, the army not only introduces all these changes, but also sets itself up as a, as a watchdog over the political system. That was never there in the early Republic. But from 1961 onwards, the army constitutionally has a task to um, overview the political system and to correct it where needed. In 1980, the military feel that, you know, um, in spite of all this, situation is getting out of hand. The politicians are unable to rule the country effectively. It's, there are all kinds of reasons. It's uh, very shortly after the Islamic takeover, the Ayatollah Khomeini takeover in Iran. But oh, whatever the reasons, in September 1980, the Turkish army takes over again. And now um, they seek another solution. They return to majoritarianism because they want more effective civilian government, but they want a civilian government under military supervision. So from 1980, particularly from the new constitution, 1982 onwards, uh, Turkish political system is very strongly under military tutelage. And uh, the military sets boundaries to the political system. And the two no-go areas in their eyes primarily are, on the one hand, socialism, communism, and on the other hand, 
uh, Islamism and political Islam. So um, from 1980 onwards, um, the 1982 constitution, mind you, is still in force in Turkey. The one imposed by the military is still in force. Um, we see a return to majoritarianism to a certain extent, but also to a strong form of military tutelage. The army has remained involved in politics for a long time. They try uh, to correct what they see as uh, the um, misbehavior of the politicians in 1997 through a successful um, coup by memorandum, as it's called. And they warn the civilian government. They don't take over power, but they warn the civilian government that if they don't behave, they will take over power. And in particular, they do that in 1997 because they're very concerned at the, the, the increasing support for the Islamist parties. And so there we come face to face with the other player in this game in Turkey. Um, the army tried again uh, a coup by memorandum in 2007, but then the situation had changed, as I will show, and uh, that coup miscarried. Of course, um, we all know that uh, almost 10 years later, in um, July 2016, again, elements of the army tried to take over power. Although it has to be said, we still know very little of what actually uh, happened in Turkey in July 2016. So on the one hand, we have these Kemalists who dominate completely um, for the first 25 years of the Republic, these young Turks, um, but who afterwards, after World War II, represent a minority which has to be shielded in the political process by repeated military interventions. The Kemalists, the positive, uh, the, the people inspired by positivism and secularism, um, very much opposed to any um, politics based on religion, they constitute a minority in Turkey and have consistently represented a minority ever since World War II. Ever since there have been competitive politics, they have been a minority. Now the counterforce. The counterforce is also quite old. And um, what we broadly call Islamism or political Islam in Turkey, uh, that is all linked to a single root. It's all rooted in the same movement. It's rooted in a, uh, a religious movement, the Nakshibandiya, that became very powerful in the Ottoman Empire from 1800 onwards and always combined a strong uh, religious element, uh, a, a sort of uh, religious puritanism with a very strong and it, over the 19th and 20th century, increasingly strong anti-Western, anti-imperialist uh, strand. Now, already in the 1940s, um, one branch, if you like, of this Nakshibandiya came to the fore in opposition to the Kemalist policies of the day, which was very difficult for them uh, because it was not a democratic state at that time. Uh, already in the 1940s, we see the emergence of what is called the Great East Movement, Ryukdo, the Great East, led by a man who was also a prominent poet, Nejik Fazl, Kusakurek, and it's a movement that is strongly opposed to this Kemalist branch of modernity, modernization, and westernization, which basically states that 
Turkey has to return to its Islamic roots and also to its Ottoman roots as a strong element of Ottoman nostalgia. That movement, the Great East, um, that emerges in the 40s but lasts until the, uh, until the 80s, has strong fascist elements and it's also strongly anti-Semitic uh, to the extent that it depicts the Kemalists as basically Jews and Freemasons. Um, so anti-Semitic, nationalist, Ottomanist, Islamist. That's one strand. Another strand that uh, came to the fore at the end of the 60s was called the National Vision Movement. And it's related. It's also a branch of this Nakshibandiya religious movement. National, in this sense, in national vision, means not Turkish. It means Muslim Turkish. Strongly connects Turkishness and Islam, and also um, has a strong Ottoman nostalgia, nostalgia for the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this movement, the National Vision Movement, unlike the Great East, uh, tries to gain a place in the party system, in the political system. It wants to work through the political system. And because of that, it founds a, a whole range of political parties from 1970 until the present day, um, which are again and again banned under the pressure of the military. In the, 70, in, in the 70s, in the 70s, in the 80s, 90s, and the military do not uh, do not allow this Islamist uh, these Islamist political parties to to operate. After the last suppression through the coup by memorandum, remember in 1997, there is. A real debate starts within the circles of these Islamists whether they need to pursue their traditional course and try to gain power for openly Islamist po uh, policies, and politics, or whether they should cast their net more widely and uh, try to submerge themselves into a broader conservative movement um, modeled on the Christian Democrats in Europe. And over that question, the movement splits and it's the latter part, the people who want to um, gain a broader support base by becoming uh, conservatives rather than Islamists who uh, are extremely successful in the elections of 2002 and have gained power and remained in power ever since. That is the AKP, the Adalet Bekalkanmar Partisi, the Party of Justice and Development. So that has its direct roots in those Islamist movements, uh, which is also very visible in its leader, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the current president of Turkey, who himself uh, has openly said that Necip Fazıl Kısakürek was his guru, his great mentor. Um, and who, uh, when a young student, uh, wrote a play which was, uh, uh, called, uh, which was all about um, communists, Freemasons and Jews as the dangers to Turkey. So those roots are there. However, uh, in the over the past two decades, over 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 the years 2002, 2021, this movement, uh, which has now become hegemonic in Turkey, has uh, undergone change. In the early period. 
at 2002 to roughly 2010, uh, this movement, the AKP, which came to power through the popular vote, also on a democratic basis, uh, has used its power primarily to, um, to um, dis destroy in stages the military's hold over the state apparatus. And so the military tutelage, which had been there for 50 years, is now gradually eroded and brought to an end, and successfully so. Uh, by 2010, you could say that the AKP has succeeded in um, making the elected politicians of Turkey masters in their own home and ending this system of tutelage on the part of the military machine and, and the bureaucracy. In that process, it has worked hand in hand with the European Union, which also saw ending the Turkish army's role in politics as a precondition for Turkish accession to the EU. So that worked and there was a uh, parallelism of interests there. But from 2010 onwards, the um, party and particularly its leader, Erdogan, has become more and more authoritarian and um, majoritarian. And in that respect, it's important to note that the 1982, I already mentioned it, the 1982 constitution uh, imposed by the military junta is still largely in place. And what that does is that it makes it possible, um, as was the case way back in the early Republic, for the majority to wield almost unlimited power through the National Assembly. And as if that wasn't enough, three years ago, uh, the president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has um, changed the system to the extent that uh, within that relatively authoritarian, elected but authoritarian system, the balance of power was shifted from the uh, Assembly, the National Assembly, the Parliament, to the executive, i.e. to the president himself. So there's another shift within that system, but within a system that essentially was imposed 40 years ago by the military. So finally, um, what is the situation now? Well, a couple of things are important to, to remember here. Um, Erdogan um, and his party, which increasingly over the last 10 years has become his party, very much a personalized regime, as is the case in, in, in Russia, for instance, um, Erdogan has nearly absolute powers. They, Opposition, the political opposition in Turkey has almost no means to make itself heard or to influence policies. And because of this system imposed by the military and used uh, by Erdogan, uh, yet it's important to remember Erdogan has never had a majority. Erdogan's AKP is not a majority government, it's a plurality. It's a plurality um, that remains in power, partly because of the electoral and constitutional system, which allow a plurality among the votes to be turned into a majority and sometimes a very big majority in parliament. And also because of um, the divisions within the, op um, the opposition, uh, in which the main opposition party, um, the Kemalist party, the Republican People's Party, the old party of Atatürk, is 
so wedded to its original points of departure uh, that it is still not attractive to a majority of Turks. In free elections, the Kemalist party has never scored above 30% and often lower. And it's very significant right now uh, that um, um, even though Turkey is in deep trouble uh, with the COVID crisis, economically, also in foreign relations, uh, and the Erdogan regime is, is definitely uh, facing enormous uh, problems. Yet, according to uh, the latest uh, polls, the Kemalist opposition party hardly scores about, uh, above 25%. And so that that gives you a sense of the uh, of the of the um, balance of power in the country. So um, that is where we are, and we have two forces: one with its roots in the Young Turk and Kemalist movement, uh, whether to a very strongly secularist, positivist uh, view of where Turkey should go, what modernity means, and the other one, an Islamist movement, which um, advocates uh, basing itself on the popular vote, because it is the much stronger party there, uh, but which has roots in deeply uh, undemocratic and sometimes even fascist movements of the 1940s and 50s. And what that does, and that's really the final thing I want to say, what that does is that it turns every, every political question in Turkey into an existential one for both parties involved. And that you, you need to understand that to understand Turkey. Whatever the issue, uh, whether um, you know, uh, a governor decides to give everybody a day off on the uh, birthday of the prophet, or whether, you know, uh, there is, uh, uh, the, uh, people stand up during the national anthem, yes or no, or whether uh, a, a, pro a, a portrait of Ataturk hangs in a government office, yes or no, all these things are seen as life-threatening for either party. And the calls for you know, secularist solutions on the part of the Kamalis, uh, for more freedom to drink alcohol, for instance, or the calls for the for the um, uh, of, the, of the Islamists for say separate uh, education for boys, boys and girls. They're all seen as going, as being about the soul of the country. And that makes the political system intractable. Let me stop there. I've been over my time already. Thank you very much, Professor Zürker. Uh, thank you very much for this very rich narration about the historical narration of democracy in Turkey and uh, um, made very useful our, for our, uh, especially for our Italian audience, I think, because uh, generally in Italy, Islamists and Kemalists, or some, somewhere also everywhere, but in Italy is very stronger, are, appeared very as very strong counterparts. So, mm. uh, so two, Oppositional protagonists of political scene in Turkey, and actually, in this, uh, in your historical analysis, we see that there are very many overlapping dimensions, and there are uh, there is uh, uh, there is so this is in this inside this strenuous opposition. Actually, uh, there are uh, there are shared. Uh, uh, political uh, dimensions, uh, ideologies uh, who make the, the, the scene more complex. But actually, I will give the floor to our discussant.
Professor Andrea uh, Graziosi. So we we leave our uh, expert in Turkey for for going to the expert on Soviet Union and Russia. So to these two big countries. Uh, Professor um, Gatsiosi is, is the former president of Cisco and professor of contemporary history. He also has taught uh, in many universities, among them Harvard, Yale, and European University Institute in Florence. He's fellow of Harvard's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies and of Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. He uh, coordinated many research projects supported by the Italian Research Ministry, European Union, and Maison des Sciences de l'Homme. Uh, he also has written many, many books, but I want just to much, recall much. the last book, Il Futuro Contro, because it's just uh, connected to our topic here about democracy in a global perspective. So please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. I, it, it's a great pleasure to, to, to offer a comment on Eric. And I will not, of course, uh, as you say, I cannot, not that I will not, I cannot add much to what is said about Turkish history because the real specialist is, and I learned so much from his books and from his, our friendship. So uh, uh, I will first do, incoherent because not not a very coherent intervention because i put together my notes while he was talking so <laughs> uh, but uh, in two parts it will be divided one historical and i will try to say something on what what he told us about turkey let us discover or rediscover or throw in a new light about both russian and italian history because i think we uh, not 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 a case that he mentioned Mazzini and then Young Italy and, and, uh, and one could have, when he spoke about the Young Tarts, of course, the, the, the Corradini was a big name among them. So the, the, I think that there is something that can be compared. And the second part will be about what uh, he said, what, what he said as to tell us about the current situation. So it's less of an historical and more of a so if you want a political commentary, after all, we're speaking about democracy. The series was about the crisis of democracy. So the first part, I think that what he told us is something I've been thinking and I want to write and I'm trying to write about. It's in a way we are witnessing, he told us about the crisis of the model of a controlled democracy. That is what in a way was now, when I think about it, if you think how, for example, in the United States of America, the very cradle of democracies, how they chose, for example, state employees at the very beginning, they had caucuses, the board was a caucus, generally Freemasons meeting in a pub, I don't know if the name was a pub, and they decided who was going to be the sheriff, who was going to be the judge, who was going to be... In a sense, even the American democracy was in a way innervated or uh, I would say organized around caucuses of people that controlled the process, uh, was not so democratic. Of course, this was much more developed in Europe, this way of controlling democracy in a way as a force. You think of the I would say the, the club, the Jacobin club, the, the, all the club of the French Revolution. This was, and then of course, I think the, you have the secret societies. I don't want to make it so long, but I think the, 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 there is a continuity. You have the secret society like the Carboneria that was the, the same idea, often with military officers uh, at the beginning. And then you have the first party which is Mazzini, Young Italy. I think Mazzini certainly at the first party. And of course, this way you arrive to the very idea that I want to, that as a Soviet historian, I, I, this is a story I, I, I conquered, you know, going back, because of course, the, the most sophisticated element, the most sophisticated form of this is the party state invented by Lenin and Sverdlov in 1919-1920. Because in, in the Soviet Union too, there was, a parliament, there were elections, there was a democracy, but this was 
ruled by a party that called itself a conspiracy, a conspiracy, even when it was in power, up, up until the 30s. And it was illegal. All that the party did was illegal up to the Brezhnev constitution of, 19, of the 70s, because all the decisions were taken in the Politburo meeting of Wednesday, I think, or Thursday, I don't remember. And then they were ratified by the government that meant on the following day. But this was illegal because according to the, even the Stalin's constitution, the party had no constitutional role. It became the leader of the state 13 years before this, you know, the, the Soviet Union collapsed with Brezhnev, who legalized this. So you have in a way, a, a form of democracy that was controlled by secret organizations, more or less, or by, you know, not, I don't know if the role of the military was formalized in the two constitutions. This was uh, the, 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 the 1960s and the 1980s, one after the coup. Uh, uh, but certainly you have the problem of how democracy was controlled by these uh, people that thought to be vanguards, as he said. So you have, uh, as historians, we have the problem of reconstructing a geneal genealogy, if you want, of this idea of how you control democracy from, uh, you know, small groups, conspirative groups, first as a secret society, then uh, as a conspirative society, then as parties, then as a party state, the idea of the party state. Uh, of course, this brings also, I don't want to, but just to give elements, I hope this resonates in what you have in mind uh, because you studied these things. You, I mean, everybody, not just Eric. Uh, of course, also fascism is this in a way at the beginning, this, uh, the idea that you have a party state that was copied more or less by the, the, the Soviet one. And, and, and there too, you had a party that controlled the state, but in theory, there were elections up to a certain point. Uh, so this is a model of a controlled democracy by uh, 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 let's say group formalized or not formalized. And I think, and this is an element that brings us already uh, because I have 10 minutes, so I cannot uh, elaborate on this, but to me it's very interesting. Uh, this, brings us to the fact that uh, this model of controlling democracy uh, became very prominent in the past 30 years of democ democracy as, as sovereign, as the Russians say, the so so sovereign democracy. Uh, uh, like a majority demo democracy controlled by the state without elements of liberalism. It became a prominent model again, I would say, with the crisis of the liberal democratic Western model in the 1990s, when we thought that after defeating this, we meaning the, the West, the West that is now a very complicated and uh, frail concept, the West thought we have won uh, 1991. In fact, it had not won at all. And, and now even Turkey or Russia or everybody else or India have other models that are not the models uh, that the West was proposing, that the liberal democracy, you can modernize without the model. China, because the Soviet Union was a failure as far as moderniza modernization went. And in the sense, it seemed a good solution because nobody knew what happened in the Soviet Union in the 30s. But once you try the model in the 50s, everybody realized it was not working. But instead, you know, Deng Xiaoping uh, clearly showed everybody that you can have the party state, an authoritarian democratic regime with national value running a successful modernization. And I think this is the new element that this is, that, that is we are in all this, uh, States, this uh, leaving aside their own history, because of course Eric was very right in underlining the, the, the Ottoman roots of this. But, and I could say that we, we could underline the Russian roots of what Putin is, but still I think there is a common element in this crisis of the Western model. And in fact, we are dealing 
as he said, and in both in the Soviet Union and in Russia before then, and now in Putin's Russia, and in Turkey and in many other places, we have democracy without liberalism, basically. This is what, what we are dealing with, I think. And uh, this brings us to the fact that we are indeed facing not a crisis of democracy, to me, as sometimes uh, we are told, but we are uh, facing a crisis of liberal democracy, in particular of the liberal element within the democracy. Because liberalism and democracy are not the same. They were never, that is a, 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 a serious thing and new. So I think this is a, a fascinating element. And what to me, what, what uh, Eric said, uh, brought to me all these thoughts that I've been thinking. Uh, the other thing I, I want to, going back, if I have another, yes, I have another three minutes. Because it's fascinating to me that the fact is that actually, and I here I may be adventuring on something, I don't know, but it is my impression that actually this regime, this democratic liberal regime, are very strong also because they were proved capable of managing development. I think uh, Turkey went through an extraordinary development over the last 30 years. And I, my impression though, is that this is also uh, uh, is something that is not true. It's just an appearance, though it's a very strong one. That is, these developments that uh, Italy had, you know, or Europe had uh, over 100, 150 years, actually was there anyway. It was not, that is right, I, I'm, I'm now when I think it's not as you don't get liberal democracy out of economic and social development as we thought, but in general economic and social development is more tied to specific conditions that are not political. That this is the movement of peasant to the cities, is uh, the demographic boom. Uh, there are many, uh, how to say, elements that are common to all political system and that provoke these booms uh, that after a while feather, feather out, that is, they, they stop. And all the regime that have been you know, ruling the countries during this boom are automatically thought to be the reason for this economic and social boom, for these miracles. The, the term is quite interesting. So in Italy, the one thing that the Christian Democrats were great because we had economic boom during the Christian Democrats, because people tend to, to put together the two things. But it is my impression that any kind of regime had that boom. Even the Soviet Union had an economic boom because of urbanization and in the 50s and 60s. That is because, you know, people that went to school and learned how to, 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 to work better and so on and so forth. So my impression, and I will finish with this also, that is that we have been learning that economic development can be managed by any kind of regime, basically, if it understands a few key things, that our model is not a dominant model, certainly is no more, and that this fact that uh, different, let's say, democratic but illiberal forces can compete in a democracy is normal. Even in Italy, in a way, we have this. And if I may say so, I, 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 at times I fear that this will come out, can come also to Europe, that, that, that there are signs of this. So I think that the, the Turkish history is a great history to understand dynamics in a new way, that is to leave our previous, let's say, simple or hope, you know, even, even I would say, wishful thinking uh, model, but uh, that, that in fact, um, this has been a stage in world history and possibly this is over. This is, this is my impression. We don't know where we go, but this is my, my conclusion that is not a conclusion. Anyway, I am really appreciated what Eric told us. I now know more about Turkey than I knew. And 
No, there was just the last point I told you it was chaotic, my intervention, but I want to, to say, when he said this nationalists that believe they had to educate the nation, but this has been, a, how to say, common trait to all nationalist parties. If you think even the, the young Italians, uh, the young Italy, Mazzini, if you think the, 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 both the, what is called the historic right of the, the, the left in Italy, now we know that the left in Italy has been born as an extreme nationalist movement in, in the, all the tradition, all the new research about our resurgimento prove how strong the nationalist streak was within the left. The, 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 the left criticized the right because it was not nationalist enough, did not repress the peasants enough, did not do did, did this or did that enough. Uh, and so I think too, this is something that we want to reconsider even, you know, at, at least in Italy or in Europe, even some nationalist experience of the 19th, 20th century, also in a new way. I think Turkish history is much to teach us in this term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Graziosi. Uh, it's, uh, it was not chaotic at all. I think it was very, uh, it's very important to uh, take out Turkey out to take Turkey out from its exceptionalism to understand how uh, also uh, the analysis of Turkish events, political events can uh, contribute to have the larger idea of actually democracy in a globalist perspective, which is our attempt with this webinar and then with the conference. So I will um, ask to uh, Professor Zurke if he uh, would like to react to uh, Andrea Graziosi's words. And then uh, I will invite people who want to uh, ask questions or have comments to uh, give a, a sign, just raising their hands virtually or writing the chat. So if, if Professor Jürke want, wants to comment, I will give him the floor and then waiting for questions and comments. Yes, thank you. Briefly, then, uh, thank you, Andrea. Yeah, that's a, that. Th those are extremely valid points, I think. And uh, yes, um, Turkey is a very good case of democracy without liberalism, uh, and that that is precisely the problem, of course, uh, because that uh, means that the system is an election-based majoritarianism without the liberal safeguards to look after the interests of those who are not the majority in whatever way. And so that, that is exactly the problem. And I think you're, you're right. Um, um, I think there's a parallelism between uh, Russia and Turkey in also in the sense that um, um, both have been the object of a great deal of disillusionment in the West. And because um, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, for a while, however chaotic the transition was, there was a belief that uh, there was a genuine move towards democracy in Russia. Uh, and the same is true for Turkey. Uh, and and um, uh, slightly later, of course, with, um, uh, with the early Erdogan years. And there, was, there were great expectations on Russia and also on Turkey becoming European, so to speak. And in both cases, of course, there has been a rude awakening. Um, and um, I think that that, uh, uh, that is an interesting parallel. Um, the, the nationalist dimension, yes, um, that is uh, prevalent. And in fact, um, um, both sides of the debate in Turkey continuously accuse each other of not being nationalist enough. Um, so that, that, is, uh, that is strong and, and that nationalism, of course, feeds also on a uh, on anti-Western feelings among part of the population which are also flamed and, and, and fanned by by those in power, uh, and which in turn 
feed on a discourse which is also similar to Russia, I think, um, that really says the West has made, has abused the country in its moment of weakness. And um, uh, in the case of, the, uh, of, of, of Turkey, um, the, the current regime in Turkey then always points to uh, the final years of the Ottoman Empire and the um, division of the country after World War I. And when it says the West was, um, you know, trying to, to end Turkey's existence and given half the chance, the West will do that again. And so that, that kind of feeling um, that um, in the past, they were a great empire, which in a moment, uh, at, at its weakest moment in history, uh, was the victim of Western aggression. And that the regime in power now has as its primary task to protect the country against the designs of the West. And that is a very powerful a rhetoric tool, a very powerful discourse, I think both in Russia and, and in Turkey. Uh, so that those, those, those points are, are really uh, well taken. Um, I think finally, the, the, the last point um, might be what, about what you said about uh, development taking place irrespective of regimes. Yes, I mean, there were structural changes. Turkey's enormous uh, development of the last 30 years were entirely dependent on two things. The first one was um, the um, opening up under the, uh, of the country under IMF guidance. The, the Washington consent, consensus, Turkey was one of the first countries in 1980 to undergo that process and to become integrated into the global economy on the terms of the IMF. And the second one was, of course, the perspective of membership of the EU um, from 2004 onwards. Uh, the two combined unleashed an enormous investment boom, primarily in infrastructure, uh, which has fueled this, this Turkish boom over the, over the last 30 years. And so it's IMF and EU, you might say, almost irrespective of who was in power in Turkey, as long as those in power in Turkey um, were, um, you know, um, cooperating in the in the right sense, in the, uh, in the first uh, instance with the IMF, and the second with the EU. In that sense, it could have been anyone. Lei è scomparsa? No. Ah, ecco, ah, there she is again. Yes. No, 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 I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I've just lost you. That was the question. So thank you. Um, I'm, I just uh, thank you for this comment, but uh, I'm, I'm waiting for questions. Uh, it seems to me that there are not yet questions. Uh, here now, I see a message. Okay, there is Filippo Benedetti. Uh, asking a question in the chat, maybe he, so. Uh, I will. I, I can read for him uh, if he doesn't want to ask directly. So, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for this enlightening lecture. Pro probably it's a silly question. Anyhow, as far as you know, is the temporal contiguity between the Young Turk Revolution and the 19th Persian Revolution contingent? Or rather, does it underline a common effort with different intentions and outcomes to manage religion within a constitutional framework in the largest Islamic empires of the time? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, well, that's an interesting question. And, and uh, I would say that um, they are um, 
very much part of a single wave of revolutions, huh? the Russian Revolution, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the Persian, the Ottoman, uh, the Chinese, also the Mexican Revolution, uh, those pre-World War I revolutions. And the comparison is, is, is very fruitful because uh, there are some um, similarities, particularly the, um, uh, the constitutionalist character of the, of the movements, but they're also quite different. And I, if, you, if you leave your, uh, your email, I can send you a recent uh, article I wrote precisely on that question uh, for Middle Eastern studies in, in London. So if you, if you can provide it, I can send you the, the text. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, I, there is uh, two people. Uh, I will give first the floor to Antonio Ferrara and then Carlos Almo. Antonio Ferrara. Antonio, you need to you unmute. Have to open, you have to unmute your mic. Okay, yes. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, just a much more contemporary question, which it's about, uh, well, not exactly the Armenian question, but it's, well, I mean, I remember that one of the things uh, which uh, early uh, AKP administration did was open the archives, which I understand was part of this uh, effort of uh, dismantling military uh, uh, overs oversight of the political system. And so my question is, was uh, how much was um, AKP uh, policy towards the Armenian question and the question of um, Armenian genocide uh, as, a, as it evolved in the last 10 years? And how was it, uh, as I understand, driven by the an effort to um, ameliorate relationship also with the European Union. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes. Um, um, well, the opening up of the archives started earlier, started before the AKP, was actually started in the years of Turbut Özal in the uh, later 80s. Um, but they cons but you're right, the AKP governments have, have uh, speeded up that process. But one thing to understand is that these concern the civilian archives. These uh, con concern the archives of the Ottoman Empire and the archives of the Republic of Turkey. Both of them are uh, now presidential archives, one in Istanbul, one in Ankara. What they do not cover is the archives of the war history section of the army, uh, the so-called Atase. Uh, and, um, uh, everything pertaining to um, World War I warfare um, uh, is in those archives. Uh, so they're not open. Uh, they, they are part of the military archives. And so, um, and, and that's a bit strange perhaps, but um, uh, the, um, everything to do with, with 1914 to 1918, and obviously that automatically includes the um, Armenian genocide, um, is in those archives. And there is some uh, interesting material in the Ministry of Interior archives, which are open, um, but a lot of it is in the military archives. So, uh, um, Yes, um, the um, because the genocide um, and also, for instance, the persecution of Kurds and, and Alevis in the 1920s and 30s were the work of the young Turks um, and by extension of the Kemalists. Um, opening up the archives, opening up the discussion on the Armenian genocide and on the, on the, um, the mass killings in Dersim in the 1930s, for instance, were a means, were a weapon for the AKP government 
to uh, settle accounts with the Kemalists. Uh, and not just the army, but also the uh, Republican People's Party, which proudly presents itself as Ataturk's party, and therefore could be accused by um, uh, Erdogan and the AKP of um, being maybe not directly responsible, uh, but um, guarding the legacy of those of those events. So yes, that 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 is true. Um, it was used, but increasingly since 2013, so for eight years or so now, increasingly um, Erdogan has become dependent on the support of the ultra-nationalists in Turkey. Uh, he can only maintain his majority um, and probably also only win the presidential elections uh, as long as the alliance with the ultra-nationalists is maintained. And um, of course, those are, you know, almost all of Turkish politics is nationalist, uh, but the um, MHP, the most extreme nationalist uh, wing of Turkish politics, will not accept any discussion of Armenian genocide uh, or um, or atrocities against the Kurds. So and that, that limits, that severely limits uh, Erdogan's uh, room for maneuver there. Okay, thank you. We have um, at least three other questions. Do you prefer to collect them and then answer or? Uh, or just... No, we can take them one by one. Oh, one by one. So uh, Carlos Anna, please, it's your moment. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Professor Zürcher. It's been, of course, uh, an honor for for me, and I, I think I can speak in the name of everyone here to, to to hear your lecture. And thank you for the organizers because it's, it's a honor to 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 have the opportunity to ask uh, a question to to such a prominent scholar in Turkish studies, which is my my field. I'm a, a PhD student, and I'm dealing with the uh, evolution of the CHP in the in the recent uh, Turkish history. So uh, actually, my my question would be related to more contemporary uh, period. Uh, mm -hmm. That is uh, a subject that, that we have addressed in this in this lecture. And uh, more precisely, I would like to to ask uh, in, in the literature that I've come to, to confront myself with, at least in the most of it. I've seen that there is something, um, an agreement on the fact that after the 90s, uh, and the 90s especially, were a decade of uh, identity politics in which Kemalists and Islamists were, um, and the cleavage between Kemalists and Islamists were, was one of the main uh, instrument of interpreting and reading uh, Turkish, Turkish political dynamics. Uh, but after 2007, I would the the Jews getting things ready, the, the the Republican rallies and the failure of the uh, election uh, struggle on the presidency of the Republic. I've seen that um, somehow the Kemalist rhetoric and the Kemalist coherence has come to uh, being somehow disrupted. So I would like to ask, as a young researcher approaching my my research, uh, what do you think about using the uh, Kemalist and Islamist as a cleavage, as an instrument, is it still valuable in, in, in current Turkish politics, in your opinion? Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. That's that's difficult. Um, <clears throat> um, The risk of using those, first of all, you're right, of course, 2007 was the last significant attempt of uh, Kemalists to stop, as it were, the rising tide of um, uh, the AKP. And, uh, and that was the, uh, the, the year of the uh, failed attempt of the military to, to intimidate um, um, the AKP. It was the um, narrowly 
missed uh, a decision to close down the AKP, uh, which was very finely balanced. If you remember, the Constitutional Court in a majority um, decided to close down the AKP, but the majority was not big enough, and that was intentional. It was a uh, so it it served as a warning shot, as it may, uh, as it were, and it was the period um, from let's say uh, 1995 to 2007. That was the period in which Kemalism certainly was a very useful um, term to use because for the first time, really, in Turkish history, Kemalism became a popular movement not a state-imposed ideology, but a grassroots movement around uh, organizations as the uh, so Society for um, Ataturkist Thought or the Society for the Defense of Contemporary Living. Uh, so uh, for that period, no doubt, I mean, uh, there was a self-proclaimed Kemalist um, movement uh, as there had not been before, uh, uh, nor since. Right now, um, yeah, it's difficult uh, because it's not entirely certain what the term Kamalist describes nowadays, and that's part of the problem. Uh, because the uh, Republican People's Party still describes itself as, as Ataturkist, of course, um, but let's say the, the coalition of groups in opposition to the AKP and to Erdogan uh, consists of a mosaic of groups who um, are not all of them Kemalist at all. First of all, the Kurds, of course, but also your contemporaries, huh? the, the people in their 20s and 30s uh, in, um, on the west coast of, of Turkey and in the major urban centers, young people, uh, well-educated urban youth um, who are very much opposed to not only the Islamist side of uh, Erdogan's policies, but his conservatism in many ways, uh, cultural conservatism, uh, social conservatism, uh, the militarism. Um, they are not attracted to the Kemalist party or the Kemalist po program. Uh, they will, in certain circumstances, support the JHP, uh, as they have done, for instance, in the municipal elections in Istanbul and Izmir and Ankara, uh, which was one of the reasons why the JHP uh, could win those big cities uh, in the last municipal elections. Um, but it's very difficult because... Um, the Kemalist program, while rejecting the conservatism of uh, the AKP, still adheres to the basic tenets of Kemalism, among them nationalism. Uh, you could see that very clearly now when the um, uh, when the uh, when President Biden, for the first time, recognized the Armenian genocide. At one. The JHP did not, you know, immediately uh, condemn that uh, in order not to be framed as not nationalist enough or not real Turkish. So obviously uh, Erdogan, um, um, you know, um, condemned it, although he was late to do so. Uh, the ultra nationalists, of course, immediately condemned it, but so did the JHP. And that does not, that does not, you know, ring with the uh, more progressive, more liberal, urban, uh, younger generations. And so and it's difficult to see right now how the uh, JHP could attract a much broader coalition of anti-AKP forces um, without jettisoning some of the heritage, of the Kemalist heritage that they uh, cherish. So that is the difficulty with this term Kemalists. 
Uh, not anyone, not everyone opposed to Erdogan is automatically a Kemalist. And the Kemalists are opposed to Erdogan, but not necessarily always um, against his, you know, uh, military adventures or uh, um, nationalism or critique of the West. Okay. Uh, Simona Bellezza, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Professor Turka, uh, thank you very much for this enlightening uh, presentation. I'm certainly no expert of Turkey history, so I've learned a lot during uh, your speech. Uh, my question would like to go back to a more general reasoning about democracy. I mean, when, when we talk about democracy, especially historians, perhaps they immediately think of uh, elections, but actually, I mean, people, uh, especially uh, social scientists, the political scientists uh, studying democracy, uh, they stress that democracy is not just the procedure of the elections. It's made up of, I mean, in democracy, you have uh, other elements like uh, rule of law, you have freedom yeah. of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of press, you have freedom in the economic development, you have the secularization of the state, or at least a sort of division uh, between state and church or churches. So, I mean, my question, and, and for example, I mean, going back to what also uh, Andrea Graziosi said about uh, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union and China, I mean, uh, one of the reasons people say that Russia is not a democracy now is because the economic sphere is not free. And this is also the reason why it's not really developing in a, in, a, in a new way, why perhaps, I mean, in China, yes, you have a di political dictatorship, but you have more freedom in the development of economy and, uh, and enterprises. So uh, my question for you would be, um, do you see in Turkish history uh, that the other fields that are connected to the democratization process, like rule of law, uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, the relationship between state and church, do they have the same uh, line of development of the political democracy or do they somehow diverge? Do they have different history? For example, I mean, in connection with economics, that's interesting, you know, because I mean, so uh, this is my question for you and thank you in advance for your um, answer. Yeah, thank you. Excellent question. And um... Uh, uh, Turkey is a very, at the moment, Turkey is, of course, uh, an excellent uh, example of uh, what you're saying. Huh? Turkey is a, um, uh, has a majoritarian system based on elections, regular elections, which in themselves are reasonably free and fair, um, but it's not a democracy, precisely on, because of what you say, um, yeah, because the rule of law freedom of speech and uh, a degree of uh, economic um, liberalism are all part of that. And uh, none of these is in existence in Turkey at the moment. I would say that um, when you take a long view, um, going back say to over the whole 20th century, that um, they have uh, these other, other aspects of democracy uh, have indeed uh, developed uh, along parallel tracks uh, to, let's say, the political uh, uh, election-based democracy uh, with leaps and bounds. Uh, it's definitely true that um, the um, uh, freedom of speech um, was um, greatly strengthened uh, first uh, after World War II and then again in the in the 1960s. Um, again, you might say in the early 2000s, uh, so with leaps and bounds, but there's always been regression as well. And um, I think um, underlying that problem, I would say that, that the rule of law um, has been um, both uh, strong and weak in Turkey in, in periods because yes, um, the Turkish, Turkish judiciary 
uh, has on the whole had for a very long time uh, a good track record. And uh, you could say that, that the rule of law has been surprisingly resilient at times against the uh, anti-democratic tendencies of different regimes. And that's true for the um, uh, military tutelage regimes as well as the, the civilian ones. Um, I would say that ultimately, um, that situation has basically come to an end after 2009, 2010, because um, until that moment, uh, the, uh, the judiciary, also the public prosecution service, were in the hands largely of uh, Kemalists. They were in the hands of representatives of um, the, the more traditional powers in Turkey, while on the other hand, pol political power was in the hand of the elected politicians of the AKP. So there was a balance of power there, uh, which created a certain space. Uh, with the takeover of the judiciary and the public prosecution service by the political power, as a process perhaps similar to what you see in Poland and in and Hungary, uh, that sort of um, that space has disappeared, and there's no longer, let's say, uh, a possible opposition between uh, political power on the one hand and uh, judicial power on the other. So that, that means that uh, the rule of law is at the moment uh, at, at in undergoing one of its weakest periods, I, I would say, in, in, in Turkish history, uh, in modern Turkish history, at least. Uh, but your, 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 your remark, I think, is entirely spot on. Um, and democracy is way more than um, way more than um, just the uh, election process and uh, parliamentary rule. And it's precisely in the areas that you point out on the, um, um, the rule of law and free speech uh, that um, uh, yeah, the greatest losses have been endured over the past uh, 10 years. And, th and that could only happen because, as I started out saying, uh, they have had an independent development in Turkey over the past uh, uh, century. So there was something to suppress. Thank you. So we have uh, still two questions, and then I think I, I, I will uh, close the floor. Uh, there is Chidem Oz, so an old acquaintance of Professor Durker. Please, Chidem. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> it's so nice seeing you, Professor Zurher, also <laughs> like this virtually, and everyone, uh, my Napoli friends and colleagues. Um, so I would like to ask your opinion about the very, very recent developments in Turkey, um, not the, the historical ones, uh, about these anti-COVID uh, regulations. Somehow um, I'm thinking and everyone feeling the same way, I think, kind of uniting with, um, with the authoritarianism of the, of the Turkish government. And um, the opposition entering into a kind of a dead end uh, street to say, because they can't say too much against this kind of lockdowns or regulations in general to say, because the, the health issue, of course, uh, at stake. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the, the government could get over with, for instance, uh, now there is this um, 18 days of full lockdown in Turkey. These are the last days of Ramadan, 
and um, there is the there was the May Day, for instance, and there was the the um, twenty three of um, uh, April, the national holiday. So they could get over with all kinds of oppositional, let's say, uh, meeting uh, moments. Uh, thanks to some anti-COVID uh, regulations. And they also banned alcohol sale based on the fact that it's um, it helps uh, spread uh, COVID. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how to put it in different uh, uh, ways. So I, I, I was curious about your, um, how, how do you follow these developments? Uh, what would be your uh, comment, uh, opinion about this um, anti-COVID uh, Turkey to say? And um, about the opposition again, I always think the, the, the idea of state, uh, for the sake of state to say this idea, is kind of holding the opposition back always uh, against um, the AKP and its policies. Uh, what would you agree on that? Yeah, uh, hi, Chidan. <laughs> Good to see you again. Um, uh, yeah, um, and the two are related in a sense, right? I mean, um, uh, because uh, as uh, uh, in almost every country, of course, the COVID situation enhances the power of the state and and gives the state opportunities for control, which would otherwise perhaps be uh, less acceptable. But but um, um, and, and can be abused, obviously. Um, I think you're right. I think the uh, political, with the exception of uh, the Kurdish movement, um, political movements in Turkey, political parties in Turkey are all restrained by the fact that ultimately they regard the state as uh, something transcendent that uh, needs to be preserved and protected, whatever the cost. Um, it's that is a legacy, it's an Ottoman legacy, it's a young Turk legacy, but it's one shared also very much by the Islamists, uh, who also, um, perhaps they, they choose different figures and, and different emblems, yeah, with, with Sultan Abdul Hamid rather than Ataturk, for instance, uh, but the idea that ultimately, um, the interest of the state is transcendent and has to come first. Um, that is shared by, by, by the vast majority of um, the political Turkey. And I would say through you know, generations of education, military service, uh, media, state-controlled media, it is also deeply ingrained in the Turkish psyche. The idea uh, that the Turkish state needs to be defended. And linked to that also the idea that the Turkish state is permanently under threat. No. And those two ideas, because it's not just, I mean, it's not, yes. I mean, you could say that, uh, to a degree, for instance, the same um, reverence of the state is also is also visible in 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 France. And to give just one example, uh, but in Turkey it is linked to a perception, and that's not a spontaneous thing, but something that has been ingrained through generations of messaging that the Turkish state is permanently under threat and needs permanently to be defended. And that severely limits, it's, it's a self-limitation in a way, but it severely limits uh, the uh, room for maneuver for mainstream uh, politicians because they cannot be accused of not defending the country. So that's true. That, that's, that's, that's hugely limiting. And um, I think that, you know, um, a party born of the state, like the Republican People's Party, is especially uh, vulnerable to that. 
And so it limits their opportunity. Uh, and that's that comes back to to an earlier question. Huh? The, that is also why there is no political home for younger generations of, let's say, liberals in the broadest sense in Turkey. There is no mainstream party that adopts adopts a non-nationalist, non-statist. Uh, position, except for the Kurds. Thank you. We have uh, another question. Is Carlo Pallard who asked to intervene, please. Uh, good evening to everyone. I would like to ask Professor Zürcher to briefly investigate something that I found very interesting. He briefly mentioned uh, fascist or fascistic elements in the yeah. Yugdou Great East ideology of Najib Fazl Kusakura. This is a point that interests me very much because I was personally surprised to find several uh, implicit and sometimes explicit references to historical fascism, not only in uh, Kusakura. I think that uh, some other conservative intellectuals were sometimes even more explicit than him but more generally speaking in Turkish uh, conservative thought. I would like to know what the professor thinks. To what extent is it possible to speak of an influence on fascism or radical conservatism in Turkey? Thank you in advance for your answer. Um, I don't think there has been a huge intellectual influence, uh, not from, from fascism, also not from national socialism, but there has been a great deal of affinity uh, when you look at, um, uh, there, there, there are quite a few major figures from uh, uh, the Turkish political and intellectual leadership in the 1930s and 40s who displayed a great deal of admiration and affinity um, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the fascist and the, and the national socialist regimes. Um, it's... Um, in the case of uh, Najib Fazl, um, and, and he is worth mentioning because he has been so influential in, in circles of the Islamist right, um, the um, anti-Semitism is particularly uh, prevalent. Um, <clears throat> the, the elements of fascism and of um, um, uh, national socialism that seem to appeal to these people one is anti-Semitism. One is anti-cosmopolitanism. That's very strong. Um, uh, one of the reasons or the important reasons why they think, um, um, you know, uh, fascism has answers is that they reject, strongly reject the idea of cosmopolitanism, which in their eyes is also in a way linked to their own Ottoman past. They see um, the existence of Levantine, uh, but also non-Muslim uh, communities in the Ottoman Empire with strong international links. And they see that as a danger to Turkey. And, and as everywhere else, anti-cosmopolitanism, anti-Semitism, uh, they're, they're linked. They're, they're part of the same mental makeup. Um, and for the 1930s and 40s, that's maybe not so surprising. And what is surprising is the fact that it's held such an attraction decades later, still today. Um, and so uh, you could say that, that um, um, I, I don't think they made a very thorough study of fascism, uh, but they what they picked up from it, what they saw, uh, what they huh, observed happening in Italy and in, 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 in Germany, um, certainly um, inspired part of the Turks. And by the way, Najib Fazl was an Islamist, but um, 
it's not, not limited to Islamists. Uh, there were also important members of the Kemalist leadership who uh, felt very attracted to uh, the uh, authoritarian right in Europe. It's, uh, Kemalism never, never developed into a very coherent ideology of its own. Uh, so uh, for that reason, you in, in all periods, but even in the 1930s and 40s, you have very different strands within Kemalism. Uh, but the admiration for fascism and national socialism was not limited to the Islamists. But I think the more interesting question is how come, um, you know, um, it is so attractive to the later generations? Why uh, in the 19, you know, in the late 1960s, why? does Erdogan write a play and, and also play in that play, uh, which is uh, uh, about Freemasons, uh, communists and Jews as the threats to Turkey. And why does that survive? Why does that strand of, that particular strand of nationalism uh, continue to be attractive? Because it still is. I mean, Najib Fazl is revered by huge groups uh, on the right in Turkey today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Zuki. We, uh, we decided to stop at 8 p.m., but we, I have received another question in the chat. So it's the very last question, and then, uh, uh, and then it's it's finished. So it's a good evening. If not all, I, I'm I'm reading. Uh, good evening. If not all the opponents of political Islam are opponents of the Islamist nationalist critique of the West. To paraphrase what you said, if I haven't misunderstood, then a question with regard to the expectation. Turkey will have become European. Could you please elaborate further on this by specifying whose expectation it was about? In other words, by whom and why was full membership of Turkey supported in Turkey? Oh, in Turkey. Yeah. Um, well, the disillusionment I talked about was the disillusionment in Europe. I've, I've been actively involved in those discussions in those days, but uh, when the AKP came to power in 2002. Um, in the first three years of their government, they adopted, they passed a huge number of laws which were all aimed at diminishing the power of the state and imposing control, uh, giving rights to citizens um, and to elected politicians. Um, in Europe, in Brussels, but also in many of the capitals that was seen as um, Turkey finally uh, converging with Europe. Turkey finally uh, dropping its authoritarian uh, system and, and adopting a system that could take its place in the European Union. So it was very important um, to create support for Turkish membership in the EU. It's in the EU that the increasing authoritarianism after 2010 has created this feeling of, of disillusionment. Uh, because, and that was where I pointed out the similarity, or at least the parallelism with uh, Russia, and that there was also an expectation that Russia would now become a liberal democracy, a Western type country. Um, that same expectation lived with regard to Turkey. In Turkey itself, the support for um, um, membership of the EU uh, consistently for many years, for decades even, was very high, uh, but it was based on two very different um, motivations for um, the Turkish elite and middle class becoming a member of the EU uh, was seen, and particularly for the Kemalists, was seen as 
as it were, affirming Turkey's European and Western destiny. It was sort of a point of no return. Uh, once Turkey was a member of the EU, um, the the westernization and modernization that Turkey had undergone for a century could not be undone. Um, for the majority of the population, it was about opportunities. There was an expectation that um, as a member of the EU, Turkey would um, become much richer, much quicker. And so that it would be an opportunity for um, you know, welfare for um, higher standards of living. Uh, but together they meant that support for membership of the EU for very long in Turkey was above 70% for decades. It's not anymore, by the way. It's now a min minority that supports it. Okay, thank you for answering. It was a question by Moira B. And uh, I think that we have all to thank you, uh, Professor Durker. We arrived at the end, and uh, also at the end of this webinar series. Thank you. Grazie, Eric. Grazie. Thank Grazie. you very much. Grazie. See you soon. See you soon, Eric, yeah. in Naples. Bye. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, and see you in Naples in November. Wow. <laughs> absolutely. Bye. Have a nice Bye. Morning. Bye. Have a pleasure. nice evening. Great pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thank you.